Welcome to another edition of Beyond the Podium. We are six weeks out from Election Day. It's coming quickly. Joining me today is Mark Weaver from the Communications Council uh, based in Ohio. Mark, thanks for joining us. Talk a little bit about uh, what you guys do uh, in your role, as especially in a uh, heightened election season. Sure. For years now, we've advised candidates and campaigns, ballot issues, on how to communicate best to voters. We've done it in Ohio for a very long time, including in and around the entire viewing area for you. And so we love it. It's fun for us. And this is a busy time of year. Really, as you said, at busy time of year, we're seeing uh, advertising is something I want to talk about today, uh, in particular with this Senate race. We have the incumbent, Sherrod Brown, of course, against uh, Bernie Moreno. And uh, specifically here uh, in the last few weeks, we've seen an uptick in advertising from both of these candidates. What have you seen from the strategies they are uh, rolling out? Well, before I talk about Ohio, the people certainly in the Valley are going to be privileged to see U.S. Senate candidate ads from Pennsylvania and Ohio and West Virginia. Lucky you, but let's talk about Ohio for just a second. Sherrod Brown has been holding on to this seat just by his fingertips for years because he has grown more left in his tenure, He's become one of the most liberal members of the Senate, while Ohio has moved more red. Certainly the Valley has, but Ohio has moved more conservative. So this may be the year that Sherrod Brown's train his political train comes to an end, and we may see Bernie Marino as our next senator from Ohio. Well, you talk about the shift that the state has seen, right? Uh, it was it was a blue state, then we saw uh, you know fifty fifty for a while. Now it's predominantly a, a red state. Uh, Steel in the Ohio Valley was a big part, uh, you know, several decades ago. And that was made with the labor unions. That might have been a part of the driving factor there. But now there's almost been a little bit of a shift with labor unions that we're seeing. You know, we see Sherrod Brown go around. He's campaigning heavily with them. Uh, but Bernie Moreno's made a push for union workers as well. And what, what, what have your takeaways been when it comes to using union labors as a uh, maybe a target for this campaign? Well, sadly, the uh, the Democrat Party of the mid 1900s, before my time, before your time, it really was the party of the working man. It was the party of hardworking labor union members all up and down the Ohio River, both sides. But as Ronald Reagan said when he left the Democratic Party, the party did. I didn't leave the party. The party left me, and that's true for so many people in and around the Ohio River Valley, folks who thought they were Democrats, came up liking John F. Kennedy and some of what LBJ did. But the Democratic Party in modern America has moved so far left to embrace the elites in a way that's almost contemptuous of working families in places like Ohio and for West Virginia and Pennsylvania. So the Democratic Party is largely out of step with, with uh, rank and file union members. And we saw that with the Teamsters just this week. Teamsters traditionally endorsed the Democrat candidate for president, but they took an internal poll and by nearly two to one rank and file support Donald Trump, not Kamala Harris. You talked about the um, your opinion is is that the left has gone more left and that could be the reason for that. But do you think there's anything else in, in the um, workers' rights or, or, or wage that, that maybe the Republican Party has made appealing to labor workers? Well, just look at Donald Trump. About two months ago, he came out and said, let's let's not tax tips. It was so popular that Kamala Harris adopted it as part of her plan. I think that was her first policy plan. She didn't have one up on her website. And now more recently, Donald Trump has said, let's not tax overtime. Whew. So watch for Kamala Harris to borrow that one, too, here in the next couple of weeks. Both of those measures that Donald Trump advanced sent a very clear message to working people that the Republican Party right now has your back. And the Democrats are more interested in uh, giving money from hardworking people to college students who took out too much debt to get a degree that couldn't help them in their college and have them pay back that student loan without a vote of Congress. I want to ask you about the vice president presidential nominee uh, on the Rep Republican ticket, J.D. Vance, obviously serving uh, just about 18 months as a senator in Ohio before getting the nod from former President Trump to join his ticket for this campaign. How do you think 
JD has done in terms of securing the vote, um, you know, obviously he has the support of Ohioans, but uh, making sure he's still keeping the, the the promises that he maybe made during his Senate campaign while jumping into this new endeavor. J.D. Vance is a bright new star for the Republican Party, and he's a perfect example of what we're speaking about. He grew up in a home that was torn by addiction, raised by a grandparent, which happens more and more lately. And by no stretch could you say he grew up in an elite setting or even a middle class setting. Now, through hard work and smarts, he got into first Ohio State, the Ohio State University, a great school, but then Yale Law School, which typically wouldn't take someone like him unless he was truly smart and ready to take it. And then the Marine Corps. What a great story. I think a lot of Ohioans see J.D. Vance and are reminded of why we love being Americans, that this really is the country that doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter what cards you were dealt. You work hard enough and you apply yourself. You can achieve great things. And J.D. Vance is a perfect example of that. And in the same uh, flip of the coin, then, you also have uh, the comments that were made at Springfield, Ohio, has become uh, a, a big uh, topic during this election cycle, being brought up in the debate, former President Trump making the remarks he did about the Haitian immigrants. Um, then you have the Republican governor, Mike DeWan, comes out and says, not all of that's true. The, you know, the immigrants, yes, that we have seen that the population increase, but they are not eating uh, pets there, uh, like the former president and, and J.D. Vance kind of a, agreed upon uh, uh, as a stance. Where do you see the public now having to kind of digest that and see what what's real, what's not? What, what, where, where do you have to go with that? Because it, obviously immigration is an issue. It's a key topic in this election cycle. Um, but you have several Republican uh, lawmakers in this state saying not, not all of what the president, former president sa is saying is true. And you have lots of lawmakers saying that not of what all of what the Kamala Harris and, and Walls are saying is true. I think voters are accustomed to politicians accusing each other of not telling the truth. There are lots of social media accounts that make various points about geese and cats and dogs. Those things are largely a distraction from what is unmistakable. A country that is just now grappling with a difficult economy, inflation, gas, the cost of living, is taking in millions of new people. Some, By some measure, 20 million new people, and we simply cannot sustain it with our social safety net. The schools, the hospitals, the education uh, system, both uh, K-12 through and otherwise, can't sustain this. How they got here is one problem. What to do about it and how it impacts impacts hard work and families is another problem. And the dog, cat, goose thing is the Democrats' preferred distraction from why we have all these people here who are taking resources that hardworking people born here expect will come to them. Let's talk about a couple of the other topics that you brought up there, uh, the economy and inflation. Do you believe that the Trump-Vance ticket has rolled out enough of a plan, or would you like to see more from a policy perspective on how they would tackle inflation? Well, long before Kamala Harris started adding policies to her website, which was just about a week or so ago, Donald Trump had a very significant policy platform at the Republican National Convention. Everybody can go and read it online. But here's the interesting thing about Donald Trump, and it's the first time we've seen this in our lifetime. You don't need to guess what he'll do as president. You just need to remember what he does as president. If you want to know what sort of economic policies Donald Trump will bring, Pay attention to what he did for those four years in the White House. If you don't like it, then perhaps he's not your cup of tea. But if you like the way things were four years ago, he doesn't have to predict what he'll do. He can point to what he did. Uh, another, I, I do want to go back to immigration because we do see uh, we've had an opioid crisis in Ohio for some time. And a lot of that is due to the influx of drugs being brought onto these major interstates that crisscross the state. Um, do you think this is something that could be handled on a little bit more of a local or state wide basis, uh, at least to try to attack some of that problem? I know it starts. Obviously, it's people are going to say that it starts at the border, uh, but but they're here now. Those drugs are here. So how do we mitigate that? Well, the first thing, if you want to, you know, uh, stop, when they say when you're digging a hole, the first thing you do is stop digging if you don't want to get any deeper. So we've got to stop the inflow. Here's an interesting point. The federal government is not helping. Ask, I would encourage your viewers, ask any police officer or deputy sheriff who you know that if you encounter someone here illegally, what do they do? 
what they will tell you is they don't call immigration and say, come get them. What they say is they write them a ticket and they let them go. That's not how it should work. If a law enforcement officer encounters someone who's not here legally, they should be taken by immigration authorities and they should be returned to their country of origin. That hasn't been happening for a long time. And so when we've sent a message to the world, it's not very hard to get across our border. Many people are coming over, over for a better life and we understand and respect that. Many others are coming for human trafficking or bringing drugs. And for them, that is a that is a poisonous arrow aimed at the heart of our country. This is why borders exist, so we can sort out those people who we want to come here for the right reasons and those who are coming here to destroy our youth or to take advantage of human trafficking. We're talking to Mark Weaver of the Communications Council based out of Columbus. Mark spending some time with us today to talk as we are just about six weeks out from the election. Uh, Mark, before we let you go, I want to talk a little bit about are there any uh, maybe uh, state house races that you're keeping a particular pulse on? No, I think most, there'll be a few and maybe some will be close here and there. I think the big race people will look at is issue one, which is the amending of the state constitution. The official ballot language summary says issue one will force gerrymandering into Ohio's constitution and remove the safeguards of, against gerrymandering that Ohio voters put into place two different times by more than 70%. So what I'm hearing people talk about is the U.S. Senate race, you and I covered that, the presidential race, that's important. The state Supreme Court races, people like Dan Hawkins and Megan Shanahan and Joe Dieter is running for the court. But issue one, which would really do a lot of damage to our constitution, which is why I think issue one will be defeated handily, certainly in the Ohio Valley and also across the state. And again, that issue one is looking at gerrymandering across the state. And, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, change would, would make a change to how it's it's done. Uh, Mark, I do want to bounce back to that Senate race before I let you go. Uh, I, I just feel like in the last several weeks, keeping an eye on things, it's really ramped up. And it, it, not only does it have impacts here in Ohio, it has a big impact in Washington, D.C. as well with the balance of power. How do you see um, that race and maybe the West Virginia race even uh, playing a role? It looks as if, I mean, you have Joe Manchin, the longtime Democrat, and then you have Jim Justice, who's going to run and Manchin stepping down from that seat. And, and Justice has a lot of support. Where do you see Ohio and West Virginia's role in the balance of power in, in the Senate? Said it's been nearly 50-50 for a long time. It goes back a little bit. Sometimes you need the vice president to break ties. That's been true for both the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now for the Biden administration. The Democrats, you know, a third of the Senate's up every two years. People remember that. Democrats are playing defense on many of these seats. They have to defend West Virginia. That's going to flip Republican. They have to defend Montana. That's likely to flip Republican. They have to defend Ohio and Pennsylvania. Ohio, as I mentioned, I think Sherry Brown will lose. So they're gonna probably lose there. And they might even be able to take out Bobby Casey Jr. in Pennsylvania, because Pennsylvania is starting to trend slightly red. It's much more purple than Ohio. But if Donald Trump wins Pennsylvania, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw Dave McCormick defeat Bobby Casey Jr. And now the Republicans will hold the Senate no matter who's the president, by 5248. Mark, is there any uh, other topics or uh, issues or races you'd like to hit on? Maybe we glanced over that you'd like to check back in on. Yeah, we did glance over the, the state Supreme Court. In Ohio, we elect our Supreme Court justices. They run for six-year terms. There's seven of them. And uh, it's a very important race because these are the justices of the last word on state law. And so I would look for those justices who support our Constitution and who will not legislate from the bench, who will not take their personal opinions and put them into their judicial opinions. I think that's people like Justice Joe Dieters and Judge Megan Shanahan and Judge Dan Hawkins. But I encourage your viewers to do their homework and find out which of these candidates really will stand by the Constitution and uphold the law. Mark, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you hopping on with us, and uh, maybe we'll talk to you again here soon before Election Day. Great to be with you, Dylan. Thank you very much.